Uh, mm, oof. That's not good. Hello, and welcome to History Check, the show where I end up starting a YouTube series about D&D and then suddenly get a full-time job and then just have the weirdest year that everybody else has had before actually getting back to making videos. I also talk about D&D in relation to real world history, which is probably why you're actually here. Jokes aside, today's subject in my ever-growing quest to actually put content out is the Terrask. For those of you not in the know as to what a Terrask is, here's what it is. Look at the size of that boy. He's huge. Details-wise, the Tarrasque is a massive monster averaging 50 feet in height and 70 feet in length, meaning that it's lengthwise just a bit shorter than a blue whale. But I guess blue whales don't have giant arms and horrifyingly sharp claws, only matched by their thirst for blood. And yet. Lore-wise, they live deep underground with no real clear point of in-game origination listed in the Dungeon Master's Guide. There's a bunch of differing stories about where they came from, but that's really just D&D speak for, yeah, go ahead, throw them in there. You're the one that can figure out why. As far as capabilities are concerned, the Tarrasque is considered generally one of the scariest D&D monsters in the entire game, and this is a game where players will sometimes face down literal gods on their adventures. It is kind of unique in that, unlike a lot of enemies of its scope, it's not particularly intelligent or cunning. There's no master schemes or deadly plans with the Tarrasque, just raw power. It's less of a world-taking-over type of creature and kind of just what would happen if Godzilla got set loose on a medieval countryside. It's a big, animalistic boy just here to snack on some villagers and their sheep. Mechanically or not, Godzilla has a massive health pool averaging 676 HP and an armor class so high that it'll likely take a missile to get through it. Except that it has reflective hide, which bounces back things like missiles and certain spells, so maybe don't shoot those at it. I could go on about all of its different attacks and legendary resistances, but you're not here for that. You're here for its history. So let's start talking about Catholic Saints. More specifically, our starting point here is actually going to be the Bible, and you're just going to have to trust me when I say it's relevant. Within the Bible, the New Testament holds the Gospels of Luke and John, and within those Gospels, there's one character of particular note that we've got to pay attention to, Martha of Bethany. Martha is the lesser known of two very well-known individuals in the Bible. One is her brother, Lazarus of Bethany, who is so defined by his resurrection at the hands of Jesus that both Batman and Mass Effect have used his name to indicate things that could bring people back to life. The other is her sister, Mary of Bethany, Sometimes attributed being Mary Magdalene, which is not something I'm getting into right now, but I'm throwing it out there to indicate just how important this sister is. The story that I'm going to focus on with Martha is a passage starting at Luke 10.38, whereupon Jesus and his disciples stop by the house of the sisters. The passage is short, but it, in effect, tells the story of how Mary spent most of Jesus' visit listening to his lessons, whilst Martha busied herself with preparations for what I imagine would have been a huge meal, since Jesus just came up with 12 other people to her house. Martha eventually tells Jesus to have her sister help her, and Jesus retorts that Mary was paying attention to the more important thing, whilst Martha was busy and distracted with many things. And that's basically the story. It's a really short passage, but it shows an important detail of Martha's personality, her diligence. And also that she's bossy enough to tell Jesus what to do, but that's not really important here. The three siblings and the stories relating to them take place in Bethany, which was located in the then-Roman province of Judea. There's a lot of detail here that we're going to skip over, but for our purposes, it's important to note that after Jesus' death, resurrection, and ascension, that Martha is said to have left Judea and ended up in what is now known as France. At some point, Martha ended up venerated as a saint of the Catholic Church, whereupon the aspects often attributed to her are want of maturity, common sense, and diligence towards others. There's a lot more I could go over about St. Martha and her siblings, but I'm not a Christian history channel. I'm a D&D &D history channel, so let's move on to the next relevant part of history for the Tarrasque. A Catholic priest. Wait. Jacobus was born sometime around 1230 AD in the city of Varin, Italy, thus he'd forever be known as Jacobus de Varin because that's kind of just, just how things worked back then. In 1244, when Jacobus was 14-ish, he joined the Dominican Order. The Dominican Order, as a side note, is an order of Catholic priests dedicated to preaching the Word of God. It was a massive deal back in the Middle Ages, as the Dominicans were just about everywhere, and were well known for their scholarly pursuits. The Order actually is still around today, which is kind of wild to think about, but their job was to preach and to teach. And preach Jacobus did. The man was exceptionally industrious as he rose in the ranks of the Dominican Order. He helped to get a Dominican master that he disagreed with removed from power, and eventually ended up beatified as the Archbishop of Genoa. The man's life with the church was long and productive. But by far, Jacobus' most lasting contribution to the world was the Legenda Aurea, known from here on out as the Golden Legend for our purposes. Written by Jacobus roughly around 1260, the Golden Legend is a collection of stories, accounts, and legends about every person in the Catholic Church that was venerated as a saint at the time. The book was rather quickly spread throughout 13th century Europe, likely due to it having a bunch of interesting stories that were written in rather plain Latin, whilst being decidedly not heretical as far as the Church was concerned. 
The Golden Legends legacy was massive, with it being translated to every language in Middle Ages Europe and with over a thousand manuscripts discovered over the years. And since the Golden Legend was a book about saints, it would serve that would have a chapter about the life of Saint Martha, right? Considering she was a saint, that quite literally shows up in the Bible. But this chapter would put Jacobus into an odd spot, as he didn't really need to retread the stories about Martha from the Bible, but he definitely had to write about her. So, the best place to get information about the venerated saint of common sense would obviously be her burial site, located in a small town in southern France. Thus, the story that was put into the Golden Legend about Saint Martha is the story of her taming a giant monster that plagued the small town. The legend goes that when Martha came upon a French village, she found that its people were beset by a terrible dragon. Uh, no, not, not that kind of dragon. See, medieval descriptions of dragons just kind of varied wildly from place to place and person to person. The dragon described in the Golden Legend by Jacobus is said to be half beast and half fish, greater than an ox, longer than a horse, having teeth as sharp as a sword and horns on either side. A lion-like head and a serpent-like tail are detailed, along with wings that serve as armor for the beast, which is, um, interesting. Especially since other sources of the same dragon say that it had the body of an ox with six legs, a lion's head, a turtle shell, and a scorpion sting. Listen, this is the art they used to represent it in the Middle Ages. It's what I'm using as a reference for my own purposes. And all you need to know is that this thing is certainly called a... dragon. Anyways, Martha arrived into this small village to find its people distraught, as a dragon had settled in near their village, and despite all of their best attempts, they had failed to kill the creature. They attempted to stab it, shoot it with arrows, and even hit it with a cast of stone, and by all accounts, the beast was impervious to their attacks. The dragon that plagued the small village so badly was known as the Terrask, 1R. The villagers begged Martha to help him against the Terrask, since she had all that, you know, Jesus in her background, and the saint of common sense agreed to go out into the woods by herself, against a dragon. So Martha set out, into the woods of France and cross in one hand and holy water in the other. Upon finding the creature, which was also currently eating a dude, resting in a riverbed, she began to speak the gospel to it, and calm its sour temperaments with the word of Jesus and a spritz of holy water. Which worked. The creature was calmed and tamed. It said that Martha then contained the creature with her girdle and led it back to the original village to show how great the power of God was, and the villagers in town responded by promptly murdering the subdued and tamed dragon for some reason. Martha, seeing an opportunity to spread the word of Jesus to the violent masses, began to do much the same as she did for the Terrask, preaching the word of Jesus and showing the power of the Lord until the gathered crowd converted. The town from there on out named itself Terrascon in the memory of the dragon that they, for some reason, killed. And Martha spent the rest of her days there, even at some point resurrecting a guy that had fallen into the nearby river and drowned. But, uh, M Martha's propensity towards necromancy isn't the discussion here. The Golden Legend, as said before, was spread all over Europe, and the legend of Martha and the Terrasse spread with it. It became a cultural touchstone for southern France, where just so much art of the creature has been made, and the story survived all the way from Jacobus's retelling of it to the modern day. So how does the Tarrasque with one R from the Golden Legend go from its mythical origins to the two R'd beast of D&D? Godzilla! I mean, maybe, I have no real proof of that. Really, the only connection that I have to Godzilla is that the spikes on the Tarrasque back grew more and more aligned with an upright position as the additions went on, making it look a bit more closely to Godzilla's signature back ridges, but, well... <laughs> There's not really a through line here like there was with Three Hearts and Three Lines. The Tarrasque just kind of pops into AD&D's Monster Manual too, and if it really did have a heavy connection to Godzilla, you would think there would be more like atomic breath and lightning associated with it, which there isn't. In AD&D's Monster Manual too, its description is a bit closer to the one that Jacobus gives in the Golden Legend with its weird fishy face. And other than that, it doesn't share a lot of similarities to the creature of legend. I mean, I guess maybe the shell? Like I said, there's not a lot to go on here. There's not really a lot to talk about as far as meta history is concerned here either. I mentioned before that the Terrasque has reflective hide that can bounce back arrows in certain spells. That's probably a reference to the inability of the villagers in the original story to pierce it with spears and arrows, but honestly, that's just kind of it. If I had to come up with a theory about the D&D Terrasque, it's that at some point, someone working on Monster Manual 2 heard the name or story, thought it was cool, and put it into the book. Perhaps after reading the Golden Legend, which I think is supported by the fact that the creature does have that weird fish-like face described by Jacobus, whilst lacking most of the factors associated in traditional art of the beast. The Terrasque has also gone relatively unchanged since it was introduced to D&D. Sure, the artwork has updated, moving the spikes to a more upright position like I said before, and just generally advancing, but... Well, from about 3rd edition onward, the Tarrasque remains roughly the same in artwork, and the description of the beast barely changes from book to book. I could go on and on about small stat changes, but none of us really want that. So that being said, I think I'm basically 
done here with a Tarrasque. If you made it all the way through this video, thank you so much for watching, and if you're sticking around for my outro, here's a small fun fact for you. According to the Golden Legend, Catholic priests can exercise not just demons, but also dragons. Isn't that weird? I think it's weird and hilarious. And if you enjoy weird and hilarious facts like that, you should like and subscribe. It really helps the channel out when you do. And with all that said, I'm done. I'm hoping I'll be back before... Yeah, that happens again. But, until my next video, keep an eye out, and good rolling.